Hi guys, I am coming to you from the science lab today. I realized that uh, if I'm going to talk about magnetism, I can't really do that without a bunch of stuff, without a bunch of little doodads like uh, compasses and magnets and voltmeters and ammeters and big loops of wire and stuff. So uh, I came into the lab today so that I could get through chapter 27 talking about the basics of magnetism. Um, and maybe even get to the chapter on magnetic induction. Uh, and uh, I might actually shoot all the videos in the lab today. So there's going to be lots of jumping around and changing camera angles and stuff. Um, but uh, it's a lot easier to talk about this stuff with some toys to play with it than it would be at home. So um, I apologize for all the weird cuts and jumping around, but um, hopefully it'll be, uh, it'll, it'll be an okay video in the end. So maybe one of the first things to establish about magnetic fields is, first of all, we've known about them for a really, really long time. Um, we've known about uh, naturally occurring magnets. There are certain rocks that you can just find outside sometimes uh, that are magnetic. They will uh, attract small bits of metal and other, um, <coughs> other bits of uh, magnetized stone. Uh, the ancient Greeks called these, I think it was the ancient Greeks, called these lodestones. Um, so magnetism is a naturally occurring uh, effect, um, but we can also artificially magnetize things. Um, we can make very, very strong magnets nowadays. You guys see me play with these magnets in class all the time. Um, and uh, one of the first things we notice about magnetism is that um, it generally affects metallic objects. Uh, these paper clips are uh, strongly attracted to this magnet. Um, uh, these screwdrivers are strongly attracted to this magnet, but not all metal objects. For example, the lab weights that we use in lab and our mechanics experiments, which are made out of some kind of alloy like brass, don't seem to be attracted, get out of here, screwdriver, don't seem to be attracted to uh, metal at all. Do I have any change in my pocket? There are some uh, metals uh, that don't seem to be attracted to magnets and all. So the magnetic force experienced by macroscopic objects seems to depend in some way uh, on their composition. We know that uh, the Earth has a magnetic field uh, and we built compasses to allow us to navigate um, and find north because the Earth's magnetic field uh, naturally attracts a compass needle north. We can mess with that compass needle with a stronger magnet, but if we take all the other magnets out of the way, um, the Earth's uh, magnetic field will cause this tiny magnetized needle to um, pivot in a particular direction that we call north. Um, all magnetic fields that we uh, see in nature seem to be dipole fields. We we've seen electric dipole fields um, in our little virtual electric field labs. Um, I think I showed you guys these little uh, magnetic field visualizers when we're talking about electric fields. They're just little loose um, magnets and little plastic, uh, plastic circles that allows them to move around. Um, if we put a magnet, a strong magnet, in this uh, or on this field visualizer, we can see that the magnets align themselves with the direction of the magnetic field. In other words, if I put a uh, compass here, the compass will always point in the direction of those field lines. Here they point perpendicular, here they point towards the one pole, here they point away from the one pole. Um, and we can see this with any kind of magnets, although the magnet might not be strong enough. Yeah, you can kind of see magnetic field lines here and here. Maybe this magnet will be a little bit stronger. Okay, okay we can see the magnetic field lines. So um, there are no little magnetic charges uh, the way there are electrical charges. We talked about what causes an electric field. We talk about the fact that there are positive electrical charges and negative electrical charges. Um, some particles, like electrons, have a negative charge. Some particles, like protons, have a positive charge. And this is a sort of fundamental irreducible property of uh, certain particles. Charge isn't made of something. Charge isn't caused by something else. It is a property of particles that is, as far as we can tell, uh, fundamental. Magnetism is not like that. Um, magnetism is not fundamental. Magnetism is caused by the action of electrical charges. So um, we can make 
magnetism by simply making electrical charges move around. Um, what this means is that uh, we could actually strike the word magnetism from our vocabulary entirely and take it out of our physics textbooks and always talk about the actions of moving electrical charges and changing electric fields. Um, but even though we know nowadays that um, magnetism is not exactly fundamental, um, we still talk about magnetism as a force uh, of its own, um, despite the fact that it's caused by electrical charges. Um, a couple things about magnetic dipole fields um, really quickly. Since we, if we look at, uh, again, one of these magnets, here's a magnet that's got labeled north and south poles. Uh, it's from a drawer in the back of um, the science lab. If we put a compass uh, near that magnet, we can see um, that uh, the, f the compass changes to point in a particular direction along that uh, magnetic field. By convention, um, just like we choose to draw electric field lines from uh, positive to negative, we choose to draw magnetic field lines from north to south. And we should kind of know what a dipole field looks like by now, something like this. Point this way, point this way, point this way. Um, what's harder to draw, uh, because we can't get in there and put our compass in there, is the field lines uh, inside the magnet, um, which uh, still point from north to south, in this case from north to south inside the magnet. You may know that if you take a magnet and you break it apart, you don't get a north magnet and a south magnet. What you get is a new magnet with a north pole and a south pole and a north pole and a south pole. And this strengthens the idea that um, magnetism isn't caused by tiny, tiny microscopic north poles and tiny, tiny microscopic south poles. Um, it's more complicated than that. Um, one thing, just while we're talking about the Earth's magnetic field really, really quickly, uh, something to keep in mind is, just like with electricity, the convention is uh, opposite magnetic poles attract one another, uh, like magnetic poles repel one another. If we think about a compass, uh, a compass's N needle, the usually painted red or gold, um, points to the North Pole, which means that the North Pole of the Earth, okay, the North geographical pole, of the Earth up here attracts the north pole of a compass needle. If opposite charges attract one another, and sorry, opposite poles attract one another, and like poles repel one another, that means that the north pole of the Earth is actually the south pole of its magnetic field, okay? Because it attracts the north end of a compass needle, right? So the Earth's magnetic field, okay, from north to south is actually like this. The north magnetic pole and north geographical pole is actually the south pole of the Earth's magnetic field. If the Earth were a big uh, bar magnet, we would draw an S up here where Santa Claus lives and a N down here where the penguins live. Um, that's just one of those weird conventions that's historical, uh, just like the direction of current that we just have to sort of deal with. Another thing I want to demonstrate really quickly is the relationship between electric currents and electric fields. Um, if we were having labs, we would actually do some experiments with this apparatus. This is just a compass, uh, a regular uh, compass that points north if there are no other magnets around. And this is uh, a bunch of just different loops of wire. Here's uh, four loops wired in series. Here's just a single loop of wire. Here's a big loop of wire. Um, and they all have places where you can plug them into a, let me see if we can, point the camera over there, a volt, well that's really hard to do, a, uh, a voltage source, just a power supply, a DC power supply um, that I can turn on and off here. Um, so if we look at the compass and its behavior around this loop of wire, it, uh, once it settles down, why is it spinning around, oh, could it be the, is this camera messing it up? This camera might have a magnet in the base. Um, the compass points north, Okay. The current in the voltmeter is off. If I reach over here and I turn the current in the voltmeter on, we see that the arrow deflects. The gold end of the arrow points sort of that way. If I switch these leads, 
okay, and change the direction of the current, what I should see is when I turn the current on, the needle deflects the other way. Let me turn the current off, flick our needle a few times, just get it settled down pointing north. Come on. So if I turn the current on now with the lead switched, the gold end of the magnet points the other way, it points this way. So what we can see here is that uh, electrical currents cause magnetic fields uh, that can affect a magnet, and that the direction of those uh, currents is important, that changing the direction of the current changes the direction of the magnetic field. So having established that electric currents can create magnetic fields, uh, I want to show the opposite, which is that uh, electric charges feel and respond to uh, magnetic fields. Um, what I have here in the back of the classroom, I always keep one of these around just for this demonstration, um, is an old CRT cathode ray tube television. If you don't know how old CRT televisions worked, uh, the reason they are so thick is because what's inside this box is actually an electron gun that shoots a beam of electrons from the back of this television to the front of this television. And when those electrons hit the phosphor screen on the front, they cause that phosphor screen to glow. Um, we won't get into the details of how uh, color versus black and white TV works. For now, just imagine a beam of electrons moving from the back to the front, hitting a screen, causing the screen to glow. And that beam of electrons is scanned back and forth from top to bottom over and over again. And it draws the, pix the picture one line at a time, uh, many times per second. Um, so if we imagine now a beam of electrically charged particles moving from the back of this to the front of this, and we take a strong magnet and put it up to the screen, what we see is we can actually distort the picture by uh, affecting that beam of electrons. And if we get very close, uh, oops, hold on. We get very close to the screen, uh, close enough for you to see the grid. Notice that when I move the magnet close to the screen, the grid twists and is deflected to the side, um, which suggests that, and if I flip it around the other end, it actually twists and deflects the other way, which suggests that the force experienced by an electrical charge in a magnetic field isn't as simple as just an electrical attraction or repulsion. It is actually a deflection to the side, um, which is something that hadn't ever been seen before in uh, physics. When um, There's a book by Albert Einstein co-written with uh, Leopold Infeld called The Evolution of Physics. Um, and in The Evolution of Physics, Einstein makes a big deal out of some of the conclusions about uh, electromagnetic fields, and in particular this idea of a force that's not an attractive force like gravitational uh, attraction, it's not a repulsive force like electrical repulsion, it is a sideways deflective force that depends on not just the static properties of a particle, but how it is moving um, was a big deal. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that more in a minute when we talk about the expression for the force on an electrical charge in a magnetic field. So since we've talked about uh, the fact that moving electrical charges experience uh, a magnetic force, let's take a look at the actual formula for that. Um, the formula for the force on an electrical charge looks like this. Force equals QV cross B. We use the symbol B to stand for magnetic field, um, which we haven't talked about. Uh, the units of magnetic field are the Tesla, in SI units, um, older units uh, based on the centimeters and, uh, and grams instead of meters and kilograms, you'll sometimes see the Gauss, um, but the Tesla is the unit that we use for uh, magnetic field. Why a B? I don't know why a B. M already stands for mass, so we can't use M, so we're stuck using some other letter. The letter that we chose is the capital letter B. Um, this X in this equation is the vector cross product. Um, it is not just a multiplication. Uh, velocity is a vector, magnetic field is a vector, and force is a vector. And the direction of the force on a moving electrical charge is equal to the cr is in the direction of the cross product of the velocity uh, times the magnetic field. So it's proportional to the charge, it's proportional to the speed, and it's proportional to um, the magnetic field. This proportionality with the speed is another thing that Einstein made a big deal out of in the evolution of physics, um, that 
uh, before we only knew of forces that were proportional to static properties of things. Um, mass is a static property of something and gravity is proportional to the mass. Charge is a static property of something and gravity is proportional to the electrical charge. So um, the idea of a force that's proportional to a dynamical property like velocity was brand new. So what does this mean? Uh, if we draw a magnetic field in some particular direction, let's draw it towards the right side of the board here, and we imagine a particle, let's say a positively charged particle, moving through that magnetic field with a velocity in that direction. What is the direction of the force on that particle? It's the direction of the cross product. Remember, the way you find the direction of a cross product is using the right-hand rule. Um, and there are two different ways to do it. I'll show both of them. Um, one is that you put your hand so that your fingers go in the direction of the first vector, but bend in the direction of the second vector, right? So V is this way, but my hand's bending the wrong way now. It's got to be uh, V is this way, V is that way. So the direction of my thumb into the board is the direction of the force. So in this case, on a positive charge, the direction of the force would be into the board. If this was a negative charge, there would be a negative in there for Q, and the force would be in the opposite direction. A negative charge would curve out of the board. So the direction of the force on a charged particle depends on the charge. Positive and negative charges will be deflected in opposite directions. The other way to do the right-hand rule is to make a little uh, three-dimensional axis system with your fingers. Index finger points in the direction of the first vector, middle finger points in the direction of the second vector, and your thumb is the direction of the cross product. So in this case, V is this way, B is that way, your thumb points into the board. Um, that is the direction of the cross product. Let's look at one more. Suppose we've got a magnetic field out of the board, like so. So these are the ends of the vectors pointing out of the board. That's our B. Let's suppose we've got a velocity this way. And let's say we've got a negative charge. Okay, so a negative charge moving that way through the field. What's the direction of the force on that charged particle? The direction is V cross B. Velocity is this way. B is out of the board. So the direction of V cross B is down, but if this is a negative charge, the direction of the force equals QV cross B is going to be that way. So this particle will curve like that in the magnetic field. A positively charged particle would curve the other way. By the way, this is how in particle accelerators you identify uh, what particles are positively charged and what particles are negatively charged. You put them in a magnetic field and the direction that they curve tells you something about their electrical charge. Um, let's look at an example in the book and actually just do something quantitative. Uh, if we look at chapter 27, example 7, an electron's path in a uniform magnetic field. An electron travels at 2 times 10 to the 7th meters per second in a plane perpendicular to a uniform 0 0.01 Tesla magnetic field. Uh, 2 times 10 to the 7th meters per second is fast, right? The speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8th, so that's a little less than 10% the speed of light. Uh, a 0 0.01 Tesla magnetic field is a moderately sized magnetic field. A 1 Tesla magnetic field is a big magnetic field. Um, walking by a 1 Tesla magnet will you know, erase your credit cards in your wallet. Um, it's that kind of magnetic field. So this is much less than that. What will the path of the uh, electron look like? Um, well, there's a sketch uh, right there showing uh, qualitatively uh, what's going to happen. If there is a sideways deflecting force on the electron and it's in a magnetic field that is large and uniform, then uh, that sideways deflecting force will have the effect of a centripetal uh, acceleration. If you've got a magnetic field, say, into the board, and you've got a, what's that, an electron, right? So a negatively charged particle, let's say it's moving, I want to get the direction right, well, I'll put it in the middle. Let's say it's moving with a velocity in this direction. Well, let's is that the way your book draws it? Yeah, that's the way your book draws it. Um, 
what will be the direction of the force on that electron? Well, V cross B is this way, but it is a, uh, no, wait, V cross B into the board. V cross B, B is into the board, is up, but it's an electron, so it will be deflected down. So the electron will experience a force in this direction. All right, B is into the board. V is this way. If it experiences a deflection down, it will be deflected with some new velocity like that. Notice V is still perpendicular to B and it will experience a force that is perpendicular to V and B, which will cause it to move this way. V and B are still perpendicular, but now the direction of the cross product is this way, and the effect is that there will be a force always pointing perpendicular to the direction of the motion, and that will call, cause the electron to move in a circular path. We can actually calculate the radius of that circle. What are we given? We're given that's an electron, so the charge is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. We're given that the velocity was 2 times 10 to the 7th meters per second, and we're given that the magnetic field strength is 0 0.01 Tesla. So uh, if the force is equal to QV cross B, they're always perpendicular, so the sine theta and the cross product just goes away. That's just equal to QVB. We know that that force is going to be equal to mv squared over r, because it's moving in a circular path. So we know v, we know q, we know r. Well, no, we don't know r. We can find r from this formula. If we solve this for r, we can find the circular path's radius will be r equals one of those v's cancels what's that mv over qb is that what your book gets r equals mv over qb yeah so uh the only other thing we would have to look up is the mass of the electron i don't know the mass of the electron off the top of my head 9.1 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms so you can follow along with this example. I won't go through the whole calculation. Your book does this calculation. Um, example 27-7, page 715. Again, in something like a particle accelerator, scientists use magnetic fields to determine not just the charge of electrical particles, but their mass. If instead of knowing R in this formula, we measured R, we could use that to calculate m, and we can identify the mass of a particle moving in a particle accelerator, moving through a perpendicular magnetic field. The last thing I'll talk about in this video is uh, section 27.3, which your book actually does before what we just did. I don't like it in this order, um, which is the force on a charged uh, an electrical current in a magnetic field. Um, and we can see where this equation comes from. Now that we've seen the, the force on an individual electrical charge is equal to QV cross B. Cross B. And we think about, well, what's... If you've got a wire with electrical charges moving through it, remember the convention for talking about electrical current is just the direction of flow of positive charges. Um, what's the velocity, well, the velocity of those particles is just how far they go in a certain amount of time, right? So we can write this as Q times some length over time cross B, or I guess that length is a vector, what, what direction they're going. Um, but we can regroup this Q over T And the amount of charge that passes a point in a certain amount of time is what we call a current. So if you've got a current carrying wire, the force on that current carrying wire is equal to the current times the length of that wire, move that down a little bit, uh, crossed with the magnetic field. And again, the direction of the current 
determines the direction of the force. We've got to be careful on all these problems if we're talking about the direction of the flow of the conventional current, which is the direction of the flow of positive charges, or we're talking about the direction of the flow of electrons. Um, that'll just put a negative sign in front of your current. So you've got to watch out for that. Um, so your book goes through a couple of examples. Uh, your book does the example of uh, a current carrying wire in a magnetic field. Uh, that's example 27-1. Um, and some examples of uh, using actually magnetic fields to accelerate um, a movable wire through a field. Uh, I'm not going to go over these. You can go over these two examples um, on your... Well, I might make a separate video solving some of these examples. But um, I think that's all I want to say in this video about just the phenomenon of magnetic fields. Um, I'll sign a couple of simple QV cross B problems. Um, just before we, uh, we stop, though, um, because I probably won't say anything else about this, we've seen uh, a formula for the electrical force on a charged particle, which is equal to Q times the electric field. Um, we've now got a formula for the magnetic force on a particle, which is Q V cross B. Um, if we combine those into a single equation, we can get a equation for the total force experienced by a particle traveling through electric and magnetic fields. Uh, and this is sometimes called the Lorentz force equation. It's Q E plus V cross B. So if you've got a particle traveling through some combination of electric and magnetic fields, it experiences a force of QE in the direction of the electric field and V cross B perpendicular to the magnetic field. That's equation 27-7 in your textbook. And again, we usually call that the Lorentz force equation. Okay, so I'll leave it there uh, and then uh, maybe give you a couple more problems and then we'll talk about magnetic induction.